Yes, and our next 15-minute speaker is uh, R.P. Uh, Manassian, and she is uh, a, a clinical professor, and that's wonderful because all of us, almost everybody who's giving talks these two days, are clinicians or have some clinical background from psychology or psychiatry or uh, pathology outside of uh, the specific research that they're doing. And uh, 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 R.P. has indeed um, mixed, as many of us do, her clinical work, which takes a great deal of time, uh, with research. And uh, her research often has focused on uh, understanding the relationship between biology and behavior. And her talk today is regarding understanding brain dysfunction in psychiatric, uh, in a psychiatric population, a broad population, and uh, she's telling us a bit about what physiology can tell us as an entree into what's going on in the brain. Arpi, thank, thank you me. so much, Mark, and I'm thank you for inviting me to present here. I'm I'm just honored to be presenting with um, luminaries like Larry Squire and others. So I'm I'm really glad to be here. Uh, all right, so um, I'm going to review a little bit of ancient history, uh, and then I'm going to talk about three um, uh, physiological domains that have some inf implications for brain functioning. Uh, you have seen this slide in some form or another um, a few times yesterday, um, if you were here. Uh, and for me, um, this was uh, the slide that really inspired my, the graphic that really inspired me to go into the area that I went into. Uh, so I was an undergraduate at UCSD psychology major, and there I was in my upper division uh, psychology class, and Dr. David Braff came and uh, gave a lecture about schizophrenia and showed this slide, and as you can see, this is the broken brain slide, the idea that um, that we all have sort of this normal filter in our brain that helps us um, gate out excessive or irrelevant information, but in schizophrenia, this is disrupted, leading to cognitive fragmentation. So he presented this, and I was hooked. Um, I um, had just read Doors of Perception by Aldous Huxley. You know, it was college, after all. And uh, he had done, you know, he sort of posited something, uh, very, a very similar concept for the experience of, of being on hallucinogens. So this idea and this graphic was really inspirational. Um, and I resolved that this is what I wanted to study. Um, so I pursued and somehow um, got um, into uh, David's lab as a research undergrad research volunteer. And then there began my academic life at UCSD. So um, I like to tell people that I grew up at UCSD, um, like a lot of folks who have presented here already today. Um, as I said, I did my undergrad at UCSD. I joined Dr. Braff's laboratory in my undergrad years. Um, I went on to get my PhD at the California School of Professional Psychology, but I collected my dissertation data at the VA um, and also at UCSD. I went on to do my pre-doctoral psych internship here, my postdoctoral fellow in the T32, the Biological Psychiatry and Neuroscience Fellowship, and then finally joined the faculty. But I do have academic parents, um, and here they are, uh, Dr. David Braff as I told you. Um, his lecture and his work on schizophrenia inspired me. Uh, Dr. Martin Paulus. So my dissertation involved um, nonlinear dynamic analysis and the concept of chaos theory. And uh, Martin introduced me to that. And then Dr. Mark Geyer helped me actually understand nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory, for which I'm very grateful. And he continues to be a, vi a valued collaborator to this day. Uh, Dr. Eric Granholm, chair, uh, on my committee, uh, on my dissertation committee, and very importantly, taught me um, the importance of graphically depicting your hypotheses. If you could draw out the figures um, that uh, that would support your hypotheses. That was, uh, and that was seems very simple, uh, but really valuable for a young researcher like me. And I think he told me that Nelson Butters taught it to him or something like that. But very, very important. Um, and then, last but not least, more, um, you know, my my uh, dissertation chair, uh, still uh, my boss, a mentor, and a valued friend. Most importantly, uh, Bill Perry. And I also want to give a shout out to Neil Swardlow, by the way, who. Um, as I was getting ready to defend my doctoral dissertation, I, I had presented it. I did a mock defense at the um, at the BRAF lab, and I was sort of wondering aloud, should I present it again? Am I should I practice it? Am I ready? And Neil looked at me and said, 
measure twice, cut once. And, um, and I, I love that, and I've uh, used it ever since, and I've practiced this talk many times as a result. Uh, okay, so um, I wanted to show you how my own foray into the field of physiology began, and it beca began with my doctoral dissertation. That broken brain slide inspired me to study information processing deficits in schizophrenia using uh, pupillary dilation and visual scanning to a complex visual processing task, the Rorschach, and I, um, we computerized the Rorschach. Um, and I want to show you um, just an example of my results from the visual scanning. So these, this is a trace of two typical healthy subjects um, scanning a Rorschach, a complex stimulus, for five seconds. And you can see that five seconds is enough for them to, um, to sort of get the gestalt of the, um, of the stimulus, look at the sort of critical areas of the blot. This is what two schizophrenia patients look like, typical schizophrenia patients. So not getting the gestalt of the blot at all, lots of uh, off uh, blot fixations, and not really just sort of getting the whole picture. And um, it's no wonder when you look at sort of the visual scanning patterns like this, you understand why people with schizophrenia have impaired reality testing, thought disorder, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So that was my doctoral dissertation. And um, now I'm going to tell you about um, some of the work uh, we've done since then. Um, you. For those of you who were here yesterday, you saw this slide um, quite a lot uh, as well. Prepulse inhibition, um, a measure of sensory motor gating, happens in, um, uh, in all sorts of organisms, rodents, um, armadillos, cats, and humans as well. And um, so uh, the higher, uh, the better, the higher the prepulse inhibition, the more, uh, putatively, the more, the better your sensory motor gating is. Um, and you heard a lot about the biology of PPI uh, from Neil. Well, so, um, but we uh, were among the first study to show that, and so you heard yesterday that a lot of data gathered here by Mark and Neil um, and Dave that, uh, that PPI is impaired in schizophrenia patients, and we were among the first to show that it is also impaired in acutely manic bipolar patients hospitalized uh, on the inpatient psychiatric unit. Um, so much so that they are not different from the schizophrenia patients. Um, and um, this was sort of the, um, for us anyway, the beginnings of support for um, common neurophysiological dysfunction in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, um, specifically during acutely ill and psychotic states. And so this was back in 2001, and it was before we had all, you know, the GWAS studies that, um, that suggested and support that bipolar and schizophrenia have some genetic vulnerability, overlapping genetic vulnerabilities. So it, it, it you know, it, was, it seemed important at the time. But I want you to keep this bipolar schizophrenia overlap in mind when we go to the next series of physiological studies. But in the meantime, I also want to show you um, that we were also um, the first to show that prepulse inhibition, inhibition is also impaired in um, HAND, HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, which you heard uh, about uh, from Bob this morning. So um, again, um, uh, underscoring that sensory motor gating uh, is probably a critical function that when it's impaired is going to lead to all sorts of uh, downstream cognitive problems, probably independent of the neuropsychiatric condition. Uh, this is work that we did as a part of um, the P50 Center grant that Igor um, has directed the Translational Me Methamphetamine AIDS Research Center to you, Mark. Uh, so moving on now to a physiological index that can probably reflect brain functions that can be selectively impaired in various neuropsychiatric conditions. Um, and so motor activity and exploration um, is the study of an organism's movement in a novel environment, the quantity of that movement, as well as the pattern of exploration and novelty seeking. And that's been very informative about um, brain functioning in neuropsychiatric diseases, uh, um, especially by, uh, our work has in, been in bipolar disorder. A lot of it has been, and that's what I'm going to show you some of. Um, so uh, the behavioral pattern monitor, as, as uh, Dr. Guy introduced yesterday, originally developed for rodents by Mark. Um, here it is. And then um, this is the human version. Both are an open field um, that, it, that the organism has not been exposed to before. 
The organism goes into the open field. They're given very little, no instructions. Um, and then their, their motor activity and their exploration is quantified. In um, rodents, you can quantify that by hole pokes, um, uh, the rodents poking their noses into these little holes. And in humans, uh, you quantify it by uh, um, measuring their interaction with novel objects that are placed uh, in the um, in what we call the human BPM, the HBPM. Uh, in humans, we can also um, measure um, with continuous ambulatory monitoring. We can measure acceleration, um, at mo uh, index of motor activity, and also heart rate. So um, this is what we found um, that uh, manic. Uh, again, acutely ill manic bipolar disorder patients in the psychiatric hospital have a very specific pattern of behavior in the, um, in the behavioral pattern monitor. Increased motor activity, increased exploration, um, uh, increased object interactions, and straighter movements. Importantly, that very same pattern was seen in a mouse model of bipolar mania, the dopamine transporter knockdown mouse. It's a hyper dopaminergic mouse. Jared is going to talk a little bit more about it. It is distinct, this pattern, from how schizophrenia patients who are as acutely ill behave in the BPM. And then these are just some traces. Um, so here's a comparison subject, just doing you know, a lap around the BPM, doing some moderate exploration, a wild type mouse. This is very typical, avoiding the center of the room. Here's the manic bipolar subject, hyper exploration, and then the dat knockdown mouse. There is absolutely no avoidance of the center of the room in this mouse. The distinction here between bipolar disorder and schizophrenia is important. So whereas PPI did not necessarily distinguish acutely ill schizophrenia and bipolar patients, um, even when those patients look um, the uh, even when those patients look symptomatically similar, the BPM did motor activity and exploration did distinguish these two nice neuropsychiatric groups. So. Um, with this series of studies um, buttressed by the animal work that underscores what we find in the humans, we're starting to understand the brain dysfunctions that may be common versus unique in these neuropsychiatric conditions. Um, with the help and collaboration of John Kelso's lab, we also studied a few of our favorite genes in our, um, in our bipolar subject. The catecholaminomethyltransferase gene uh, is responsible for clearing catecholamines in the frontal cortex. The met allele of this gene um, that putatively sort of leaves more catecholamines circulating in the frontal cortex. We found then the bipolar manic subjects, those who are met homozygotes, had, as you, as you can see by these heat maps, had more um, uh, uh, activity in areas of the BPM that are rich in novel objects. And there is actually an allele dose response curve with, um, with this that you can see here. So that um, there's potentially sort of a genetic basis for some of these um, signature behaviors that we're seeing. And then finally, moving on to heart rate variability. Um, heart rate variability is exactly what it sounds like. It is the variability in the interbeat interval in your heart rate. It is a very sensitive indicator of the, the health of your stress response system, of your autonomic nervous system. So, um, and higher heart rate variability is a good thing. So, uh, if you think about it, if your heart can respond quickly to a stressful situation and speed up, but then slow down, the parasympathetic nervous system can put the brakes on when the stress is over and it's time to relax, that flexibility, that, that high variability is a sign of the health of your autonomic nervous system. When it's low, it's a sign of inflexibility in their body's stress response system and associated with mortality. Uh, so again, uh, Vicki Risbro talked about this study um, yesterday. The Marine Resiliency Study was a very large study of thousands of Marines um, who were tested prior to uh, deployment to a combat um, situation and then were retested after they returned. And this, the point of the study was to understand risk and resilience factors related to PTSD. Um, so the first study that we did with HRV was a, was a cross-sectional study uh, pre-deployment. There are a number of Marines who already had PTSD from previous experiences, and we showed that, um, that uh, uh, lower HRV was associated with PTSD. This was not a new finding. This is uh, the relationship, the cross
cross-sectional relationship between HRV and PTSD has been shown by a number of other people, but we saw it in our hands as well. Um, what was a new finding was the second, our perspective study, um, where we measured HRV at pre-deployment and then PTSD, development of P new PTSD after um, coming back from deployment. And we found that low HRV at pre-deployment among Marines who, had, who did not yet have PTSD uh, was associated with a higher prevalence of PT developing PTSD after deployment, after combat exposure. This was, um, um, this was replicated by another group, Jeff Pine's group, so we were very kind of, um, we appreciated that. Um, but it's important because it suggests that autonomic, um, um, by measuring autonomic nervous system function, you may be able to predict who's gonna be vulnerable to PTSD, and if you, can, and you know who's gonna be vulnerable, you may know who to target uh, with preventative measures. So, some concluding thoughts. Uh, physiology gives us a window into important brain functions. Uh, it can tell us about the overlap and distinction among neuropsychiatric conditions. It informs us about the validity of animal models and replicating the human disease, as we've seen with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. And uh, not only is it associated with basic biological processes like genes, but it might actually help us predict, and really this is the end goal, isn't it? Just to actually help people, um, help predict who might benefit from mental health interventions. Um, and finally, as I said to you, I, I grew up here um, and I consider this department my, my academic home. Maybe some people thought I should go away. Maybe they were right. I didn't listen, it's okay. But at the end of the day, there's no place like home. Um, so we are the Translational Research in Psychophysiology Exploration and Cognition Lab. Bill Perry, Mark Geyer, Jared Young, who you'll hear from next. Um, my valued collaborators are fellows um, and uh, were funded by NIH, NIH, NIDA, um, the VA, CSAM, and, um, and NARSED. Thank you very much. Super. So we're doing a review in this of two broad categories very much related, memory and cognitive issues uh, uh, th as they may interact.